and welcome everyone um, to the rise of organic wine in New Zealand. I'm absolutely thrilled to be um, on this panel today um, talking to a fantastic bunch of people who are incredibly knowledgeable and passionate about the subject. Um, it's one that's dear to my heart and I think you'll get a lot of interesting information about what's going on in organic wine in New Zealand because there, there is a lot. Uh, so with me today, um, we've got Anna Flaude, who's winemaker and GM of Te Whare Ra Wines in Marlborough, um, which she owns along with her husband, Jason Flaude. Um, I'm joined by Hugh Kinch, who's winemaker and estate manager at um, Pyramid Valley Wines, which are based in North Canterbury. Um, and we're also joined by um, Jared White, who is um, organises the wine and viticulture um, for Biogrow, which is New Zealand's largest organic certifier. Uh, and they're responsible for 98% of the organic wines in New Zealand. Um, Jared's also been involved in the exec of Organic Wines New Zealand since its inception. So a super knowledgeable team here and excited to have a chat. So um, many of you will be familiar with New Zealand Wines has got a very strong um, sustainable wine growing program, uh, which has been going for 25 years now. And there's around about 96, 97% of uh, producers um, vineyard land certified under that. So we're no stranger to um, looking after the land and making sure that that's a, sustainability is a strong platform for our wines. Um, but obviously organics is... Um, one step further along, or quite a, lot, quite a few steps further along in many cases uh, from that. And that is something that's really on the rise here in New Zealand. So um, between the 2017 to 20, um, 20 period, there's been a 33% increase in certified um, uh, vineyards in New Zealand um, and a roughly parallel um, increase in the sales here domestically. Our uh, um, organic wine exports have risen by 65 or to 65 million, which is um, a pretty impressive sort of stat. So there's now over uh, 2,200 um, hectares of organic wine, uh, sorry, organic um, vineyards certified here in New Zealand. And there are also um, quite a large number of people who are um, sort of, I guess, moving towards organics, either in conversion or who are practicing organics as well. Um, so Jared, I think um, you'd be a great person to kick off to give us some, some context here on what it actually means for wineries and vineyards to go through that process of certification within a New Zealand context. Yeah, sure. Um, so it, it takes three years for a vineyard to become certified organic from the official start date of their organic management. So that's called the conversion period from their, from their registration date until they're fully certified. And so, uh, as you mentioned, there's, well, there's actually just over 2,400 hectares of vineyard area that's managed organically in New Zealand. And of that, 18% uh, of it is currently in conversion. So it's undergoing that first three-year period. So that, that is consistent around the world. The rules for conversion are three years from the start of organic management, the official start of organic management until fully certified. And that's different from the winemaking. So that, that works uh, vintage to vintage, if you like. If you can get organic grapes or you own organic grapes, you can make organic wine and there's no conversion period for that. So there's also, there are about, uh, there are just over a hundred companies in New Zealand that have a certified organic brand and many of those export. Fantastic. So I should actually just quickly add in here too, because in my excitement and haste to start talking about organic wine, um, there is a little bit of housekeeping I should just mention for all of you viewers out there, because um, we do have a live chat function, um, which people will be able to use um, to ask questions um, um, as we go along. And um, with each session, there is a, um, we've got a fantastic person to run you through and answer those questions. So if you're attending session one, it's Nigel Greening of Felton Road, um, who is quite a character and incredibly knowledgeable and very experienced in this area. Um, and equally, in session two, you're lucky enough to have Clive Dougal, who is of Deep Down Wines, um, and he's the current chair of Organic Wine Growers. And again, fantastic experience and knowledge. So please um, take advantage of that function. Ask as many questions as you want to as we go along. There will also be some information on the bottom of your screen that you will be able to access that has some stats and facts and figures and things. So um, big thank you to Organic wine growers for organising all of that and sorry Jared I'll jump back in because uh, this is a, a great discussion so in terms of um, wineries there's now there's well over 200 wineries I believe who have um, organic certification and they may not all be all of their wines organic but some is that that's um, also yeah that, that's right 
Um, I would say easiest way to think about it is there's, a, there's 102 brands in New Zealand or brand owners that have certification for their wine brand. And then there are also some other companies that are certified to make organic wine but don't have their own brand. So they're contract winemakers that make right. wine for other brands. Yeah. Yeah. And so for people in the North American and the UK markets, how would they be able to necessarily identify those wines and see those wines on their shelves? They'll be looking for the BioGrow label? In most or? cases, they have the BioGrow logo on the, on the label, yeah. usually on the back label. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're often branded as organic wine, in, particularly in the UK or EU. And in Canada, they are labelled as organic wine in English and French. And in the US, there's two different tiers of organic wine, if you like. Uh, there's, there's organic wine, and that's made without the use of sulphur. And that's a less common tier of wine in New Zealand. There's not very many people that make that kind of organic wine. The more common organic wine that's exported to the US is labelled made with organic grapes. And the reason for that is there's an allowance of uh, up to 100 parts per million total sulfur in the final wine. Right. And that's regarded as important to protect the wine. So most winemakers use sulfur in their winemaking. Yeah, yeah. And so that's my understanding is that some of those subtle differences in the markets are around the use of both sulfites, um, uh, yeasts, and in some instances, copper. Is that correct as to how there can be divisions there? Um, yeah, the differences between... So I'd say going back to the vineyards, the differences between the regulations in different countries, a lot of countries have a regulation which controls organic claims. So if you're going to make an organic claim in Canada or the US or EU, you must meet the government regulation. And there are not many differences between the regulations for uh, wine growing, grape growing. And for that reason, most growers in New Zealand are certified to all of those markets. But there are significant differences when it comes to the wine, wine production. Uh, and in particular, the US and Canada have tighter limits on the use of sulfur. And they allow no copper to be used in the wine. And Canada, uh, there is only a limited range of yeasts that we're able to approve for wines that are made for the Canadian market. Right, right. So that's the main differences. Um, so, Jared, you mentioned that there are the two tiers of organic wine in the US. That's something I wasn't super familiar with how that worked. Can you explain that in a little more detail, please? Yeah, um, sure. There is a lot of confusion in the USA in particular. Um, the regulation allows for wine to be labelled as made with organic grapes if sulphur dioxide has been used in the winemaking. And that for pretty much all of the premium organic wine that's sold in the US, at least all of the premium wine exported from New Zealand to the US, is labelled made with organic grapes. To make the organic wine claim, the wine must be made without any sulphur dioxide. And most winemakers are really reluctant to do that because the sulphur protects the wine. So there, although there is organic wine labelled as organic wine in the US, it tends to be the lower end wines that is available. And because of that, there's some confusion and misunderstanding about the quality of organic wine. If people mm -hmm. see organic wine labeled as organic wine and they try that, they might find that that's slightly lower quality. If they look for wine made with organic grapes, that's the higher quality in general. Yeah. yeah, and so for the most part, obviously, um, consumers don't need to worry too much about those details. They just need to make sure no. they're looking for the organic wine. That's um, right. Yeah, so Anna, I saw you nodding along there as well. So obviously based in Marlborough there, and I've got a rather lovely glass of Te Whareira Toru, which is a field blend of three grapes there. So thank you. Um, we've got a couple of other Marlborough wines um, to enjoy as well, which is, um, makes it quite delicious because there's um, quite, a, I guess, I suppose um, in terms of Marlborough's obviously uh, biggest region by a long way and um, I know that maybe not necessarily many people are associating that with organic wine but when I think of you know some producers that I really happen to love a lot of them are the organic producers based there in Marlborough so you've got quite a tight knit, knit team and you've been going there for 17 years can you kind of walk us through a bit your experience there with organic vineyard? 
So, so yeah, um, our, our kind of pathway with organics, I guess, was partly because we bought an old vineyard and it was really about bringing that back to life again. Um, we jumped in, I guess, boots and all, and it was great to have a few other supporters in the region. Uh, but, yeah, it's been an interesting journey and it's great to see so many more people now you know, coming that way with us. I think when we started, it was more of a handful, um, but now there's a significant number, especially, I guess, of the more kind of premium-focused producers in Marlborough um, and are seeing that that's, you know, great to see that increase. I think it's, um, you know, and that we're seeing that same flow through with the percentages of organic wine coming from here. They do sort of... Uh, there is some commonality with the percentages of wine that come from Marlborough anyway. So, uh, yeah, but being the biggest region, uh, that has its challenges because, you know, some people have a different focus, but it's really great to see um, some of the larger companies here uh, like Villa and Perno and Geeson and all jumping on board um, with that and having significant, you know, area into organics um, helps show people, I think, that it's not something that just the small producers can do. Uh, but, yeah, I think we, we did it for a lot of different reasons, partly about, you know, about soil health, partly about looking after our people, and then, um, yeah, I guess we're super mindful that we have a, you know, a property that has a lot of history and um, just want to look after it the best way we can. And whoever we hand it on next to, I know I'm kind of handing it over in a better way than what I found it, basically. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I know in um, Marlborough as well, you know, you've, you're part of the, the Mana Wine Growing Group down there, which is a, a group of producers, obviously, who are like-minded. And there does seem to be, you know, that's one of the things that always strikes me, not just obviously in Marlborough, but in other regions, is that there is a lot of um, kind of collaboration and chat with, with, amongst people to support one another. And that's obviously been backed by, um, you know, there's been a lot of work on the ground with organic wine growers and also New Zealand wine growers to put together things like the wine growing conferences, um, um, the um, the organic vineyard focus project. And, um, can you kind of give us an idea of how that kind of I guess is is helping to build that groundswell of people? Yeah, I think it's hugely um, I think it's hugely important to have those tools because I think some of those things are what people can sometimes be the roadblocks a little bit. I think people get worried about you know how they're going to do their undervine. So having that um, there's an undervine mentoring program that's in place now. So people who are wanting to convert can kind of pair up with an experienced practitioner um, who can help them, you know, get past some pitfalls or help with a bit of advice about what's the best equipment for their site and all that. And they're little, you know, they're helping break down some of those barriers to why people might be, you know, afraid or worry about it or, you know, have questions. Um, there's been a great um, piece of work put out as well on cover crops, you know, and things like that too, because a lot of those things don't have to be, you know, limited to organic properties. They can be, you know, incorporated everywhere. But, yeah, the Focus Vineyard Project, I think, was particularly important. Um, I mean, that's a piece of work that was done a while ago now, but that was a really great breakdown and I think helped debunk a lot of the myths that, you know, it's going to cost more, it's going to be, you know, when you could see vineyards run side by side that were in kind of three different regions of New Zealand, that was a very, um, you know, important piece of work to see that cost side by side, looking at the wines, you know, and the, for me the best thing I think I took from it was saying that um, a couple of the people involved in that project saw better quality coming off, you know, their organic vineyards, which I think has been the drive, you know, across New Zealand for a lot of the premium producers has been that's what it's all about. You know, it's about making wines connected to the place, but it's also about that drive, for, you know, looking for what's that X factor for, you know, for your particular property and what you're trying to do and, um, you know, personal disclaimer opinion. For me, organics is the way to get there. So, uh, yeah, no, it's great, great to see those resources because when we first started there wasn't as much, but, that collaboration is important to have other people to talk to when you do come across a problem or an issue. Um, having that network is, um, is yeah, make, makes the difference sometimes between, you know, staying the course and, and not. Yeah, I'm yeah. often struck. By, um, I've been lucky enough to attend a couple of the organic and biodynamic wine growing conferences and the practical information that's on offer there for producers is phenomenal, um, you know, right down to wineries being really, producers being really transparent with, you know, cost per acre of things. So that you get that strong sense that everybody out there is, is really helping. Um, I know obviously in your region, um, I've got quite a tasty dog point Chardonnay here lined up in front of me as well. Uh, they've been, um, I guess, quite high profile organic producer and also with being um, growers for a lot of other ones who've allowed some um some other companies, I guess, to dip their toe in the water by being able to buy an organic fruit as well. Um, that seems to be something that's, um, you know, increasingly available for people on the market to um, get some wines. Yeah. 
And yeah, I think really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was, so you you mentioned about that, you know, being able to get um, with the technology and things. Um, Hugh, I know when um, we were speaking previously, you mentioned about that that ability to be able to look over and see what your neighbours are doing and see that technology, and that's also you know that makes it seem, I guess, a little bit less daunting for people to take that plunge. Has that been your experience? Yes. Yeah, I think um, the. You know, it's come a long way, um, you know, New Zealand wine with the organics and it's uh, it, the critical mass is a number of doing now and then worldwide as well. So the equipment is getting better and more more efficient and, you know, the big challenge really to uh, farm organically or vineyards is that under vine management and um, now we have access to some really good equipment and that, you know, makes it practical and you can actually achieve it in a larger scale. And uh, so that, you know, that momentum's happening now quite fast, I think. Um, and then, then, you know, as people do it, more than how to use it on their particular sites. Because yeah. I guess for us as a company, we've got your Pyramid Valley, obviously that Mike and Claudia founded um, in 2000 from, as um, Biodynamic from inception uh, on this site clay limestone site, quite, um, you know, vigorous site with, you know, weeds tend to grow back, but there's, it doesn't, competition's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but then we've got a property in central Otago um, that Nick Paul and our viticulturist managers, and that's really a dry climate. So when he, you know, manages weeds, they, they generally die and they don't grow back. And then we just in the process of converting a, a, um, a little place in um, the Gimlet Gravels in Hawke's Bay, which is a total different aspect. So it's really, you know, taking, like Anna was saying, it's about your place and trying to farm to that place. And I think that's um, that whole concept of people uh, and, you know, food and, and wine in general is everyone's like looking at like how can they make their, or, you know, do their best with their place. And I think, you know, organic farming is just about that mindset and thinking about how to do that. Um, versus mm. vegetables, just like this is the list of how to do it, and then you just can do it at any property, which doesn't really work because that's not how soil works. But that was probably the mindset 20 years ago. So mm. I think the mindsets with the, with the equipment makes it you know, possible, I guess, in the knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I think that's um, a really interesting area for wine too because, you know, now there's obviously a very strong groundswell towards people having organic food and questioning, you know, where the products that they eat and drink are coming from, which um, in my mind can only be, you know, a very positive um, movement. And, and so it's fan fantastic, I think, to see people, you know, making those links to wine, which has obviously been a product that's always indelibly connected to its land, but to start to ask about, you know, is that is that land actually being looked after and, you know, how is that, as Anna says, being passed on to the next generation? Um, I was actually struck, Anna, when, when you mentioned that about um, your experience with, um, you know, I guess the the land becoming or the, the vines becoming more resilient as well. That was something that was, um, someone said to me once, um, was a viticulturist for Villa Maria, and it was after probably, shall we say, a slightly more challenging vintage um, in the region. <laughs> And um, they had recently converted um, a couple of blocks and that, that was they were really worried about those blocks going into that um, kind of season. And yet actually, um, as, as it went through, it, it proved that those the organic blocks were far more resilient to the disease pressures and things that they had experienced. And um, he mentioned that because, you know, these blocks were side by side with some conventional blocks that had been something that was a real eye opener for the neighbours there who had suddenly kind of thought, hmm, maybe these guys, you know, are onto something here. Um, I know, like, Hugh, obviously, you know, you, you're based in um, North Canterbury, um, and which is a, a pretty small region, even by New Zealand's relatively small wine industry. Uh, but you've worked in, you know, a number of regions and continuing to work with um, across the region. So I've got, you know, actually a Marlborough Sauvignon of yours here, even though you're, you're based in North Canterbury. But um, have you found there's sort of a different, um, I guess, um, you know, working across the regions, we, we've got somewhere like Central Otago, which is roughly 25% organics to other regions where it's a, a smaller percentage, a different kind of a mindset or conversations happening? Oh, I think um, 
I think uh, I guess some regions are catching up to Central Otago. They you know they started like percentage wise. I guess it depends you know, how big your region is, and that's your, your percentage can be thrown out that way. But, but um, you know, there's more and more people in North Canterbury that um, you know certified organic or in conversion or uh, you know practicing organic, and they haven't. They're just about to get um, into conversion. So that's a uh, it's that groundswell thing. So I, don't, I think it's a, a similar thing. But like Central, I guess they've been doing it for longer than 25 now, I think. And um, they, uh, it is a climate with that dry climate with weed control that they've, you know, they, they can, once they've, you know, cultivate or mow or whatever they do in the middle of summer that it doesn't grow back um, because it's such an arid climate um, which helps and that's yeah that has been the challenge but I, I you know like most of the brands in North Canterbury or the premium brands in North Canterbury are in conversion or certified um, yeah there's over 10 percent of the area in in Canterbury yeah. is now certified organic mm. yeah yeah so <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty, you know, like it, it, and with Martin, before I left Martin, we with escarpment, we were in conversion and now they're fully certified and, yeah, it's that, I think it's that whole movement of really wanting to try and make the best wine possible and the only way you can do that is by farming the best way possible and that's, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Well, I, th- I think, um, you know, if you think about the uh, process of um, organic wine or organic um, viticulture, you know, it is something that by its very nature brings you in great contact with your land, isn't it? There's a lot of um, more kind of, I guess, time spent in the vineyard and um, that type of thing has always yeah. got to be yeah, a beneficial process for anybody who's wanting to make good wine, is understanding your vineyards, being there in the dirt. And three, yeah, I guess having you know soils living organism or living thing um with lots of you know different living organisms all linked together and that's that you know acknowledging that instead of just it's a you know a sterile thing and you just add different nutrients and then it's magically go into the plants which isn't really how but, um <laughs> no that's the different the mindset i think that's yeah that learning your place and for me i guess it's three years here at Pyramid Valley and I feel like I'm just starting to learn a little bit. But it's just a slow progression of trying to learn, you know, learn the place. And then we're farming about eight hectares in Wiper. We've been farming about 12 hectares in Wiper as well, which is different. Again, it's only mm-hmm. 20 minutes away, but it's challenges. Yeah, so it's very that. different soil and environment. I think um, this is something we're quite lucky with, with organic and, and biodynamic wine in New Zealand is that we have had some, you know, some fairly pioneering people who have been doing this for a very long time. I mean, we talk about um, Central Otago with the likes of um, Ripon and Felton Road who have been established. I've got this pretty nice Felton Calvert here, which I can actually see the vineyard nearly where I am at the moment. Um, but they, you know, they've been doing this for a long time and same with um, James Milton up in Gisborne. So you talk about maybe it's almost one extreme to the other really, isn't it, from Central Otago to Gisborne um, in terms of growing conditions. Um, um, James, yet- James Milton got registered in 1989. So he's been, yeah. he's been going the longest of anyone in New Zealand yes. at least. He was, yeah. was one of the he first was- biodynamic. Probably. talks about how crazy people thought he was back then, you know, and how now people are increasingly keen to have a little bit of that crazy in their life. But I think, you know, when you have people who are also such um, enthusiastic and, and generous um, mentors for people as, you know, the likes of, you know, the people I've just mentioned have been, that's that's helped a lot for people, I think, in New Zealand to feel that they can give things a go. I mean, I guess, Jared, you will have seen a lot of that over the years, that, that in 20 odd years of biogrow, that kind of change happening, I guess, from those people who were initially regarded as relatively, you know, fringe type of, um, within the New Zealand wine industry to this becoming something that, as I said, you know, a lot of people are increasingly interested in what's happening and seeing the results, you know, as, as Anna said, there's some some yeah. of our probably high profile producers are organic and biodynamic. Yeah, I would say a high, high percentage of the iconic brands in New Zealand are now organic. And I think it's pretty fast becoming a time when if you are a high-priced and high-profile or iconic brand in New Zealand and you're not organic, 
your buyers are starting to ask why. Why aren't you organic? Look at all these people that are organic. Why aren't you? So that, you know, I think it's making a lot of people sit up and take notice. But yeah. um, I th- going back to a point you made earlier about uh, consumers being interested in the food they eat and where it comes from and the health aspects of it and the environmental benefits of it. I think um, viticulture was a little bit late to the party in that regard. So organic food production has been going on for a long time. Organic wine really started taking off the, the early sort of pioneers notwithstanding. It, organic viticulture really started taking off um, really in the mid 2000, about 2005 onwards, <clears throat> but really has, has come, come in leaps and bounds. And it's now really one of the star performers of organics in New Zealand. Mm. So there's, mm-hmm. there's 235 organic vineyards in New Zealand. There's, um, there's a very well supported industry. There's a, a good organic uh, wine growers body. New Zealand wine growers has got strong support or strongly supports the organic producers. So I think it's done really well. Mm -hmm. yeah long way that continue i know um however you know when we look at um organic um food it's always fascinating to me that i can go into my supermarket um you know and i live in a relatively small town and it's really easy for me to distinguish you know what are the organic um foods there because they are very clearly you know it's marketed over but with wine that isn't necessarily always the case you know often you do need to turn a bottle around it's it's not um, necessarily, I guess, is, is out front there. And I'm, I'm heartened that that is beginning to change, that there are people who are now displaying the labels. But I'm guessing as well that, um, you know, some of this comes down to obviously, you know, New Zealand is um, quite a, is, is a small industry and it's made up of some, a lot of very small um, producers for the main part. Um, I think um, wondering about when we're talking about some of the export challenges, because New Zealand is obviously a highly export driven market in terms of the labelling, whether this is also a kind of a um, having to straddle, like for instance, um, you know, when you're the size of, say, Anna, you can't just easily produce a whole lot of different labels and things like that for your markets. Can you kind of walk us through a little bit of those, the challenges um, of that you know we talked a little bit earlier about the different requirements for going in there but in terms of is everybody able to loud and proud organic across their wine or is it do you then have to kind of navigate that for your different market <laughs> you <laughs> certainly have to navigate it for different markets there are there are different rules in the different countries so if we're talking about uh, the UK for example EU and UK there's a particular code that is required to be on the label that designates the certifier is um, approved to certify to the European and UK markets um, and also in those in, in EU and UK the importer needs to be certified to receive organic wine even though it's a tamper proof bottled product um, they need to be certified to receive that. And there are some importers that are not. So for small producers like, like Anna at Fari Ra, for example, some of their importers may be certified and some may not. And that will mean having organic claims on some labels and, having, and taking those claims off other labels, even though they're going into the same market. So it, it's complex for small producers. And then the, the North American markets, the US and Canada, have got their own label rules for organic products not just for wine labels but then once you add the organic rules on top of that it's quite a complex area for producers to navigate the new zealand is currently going through a um, a regulation development process new zealand and australia are two of the only sort of developed countries that don't have a regulation controlling organic claims so BioGrow is a private standard, but we certify to those overseas markets that have regulations. Once New Zealand has a regulation in place for organic products, that will enable New Zealand to negotiate more effectively with those countries for market access. 
So one of the things that will, I presume, help as well is if the people who want our wines in those various markets um, become advocates for their, you know, importers to start Absolutely. to get and to, to do that. So everybody who is hopefully listening to this will be enthusiastic about organic wine. So there's a little task for you to keep pushing, keep pushing, because I know, you know, I'm looking at, I've got a glass of Greenhof Hope Chardonnay here, who are a tiny producer in Nelson. And I can't imagine, you know, just those logistical hurdles, not only to get these wines into the bottle to begin with with all the challenges that um, vineyards have to begin with but then to navigate this from an export perspective so the more that the people at the other end of the process which is you guys watching this can help with that the better I saw Anna <laughs> the very wry <laughs> <laughs> nod <laughs> and looks it's obviously you know some um, deep experience there for being a small producer getting to market yeah, it's um, it's 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 hugely challenging. I think because you it, it you know you don't I think realise so, you know you go in there with the with the right intentions, but sometimes the um, the compliance part of it can kind of suck the fun out of it. Shall we say uh, is a good way of saying it because I think it is like Jared alluded to. It's you know you're wearing a lot of hats already, and I mean for example we produce um, fifteen different wines. I think at last count. And 14 of those are, you know, fully certified um, organic uh, with BioGrow. Uh, and we are not labelling as organic uh, for the US and Canada for the reasons that um, Jared alluded to earlier, because we, um, we do use minimal amounts of sulphites, um, but also the compound that we use to make those additions um, is the one that doesn't fit for the US market. So, yeah, for example, so those wines are, you know, available domestically, uh, and in the kind of, um, you know, and in the EU um, with, with those organic on the label, but then in other markets we're selling, it's not not labelled as certified organic. So, yeah, for 14 different wines, 15 different wines and potentially 15 different markets for those wines, it's um, it's a huge, and it's a lot of cost. You know, that's the other thing. So it's adding cost all the time. And if we have to, you know, we might have already labelled and then you have to relabel or you're having to change the label, it's... Um, yeah, it'll be great to have that domestic standard in place. It's hugely important and I think it was um, sort of overlooked, I think, originally, not not by Biogrow, but, you know, it's great to see that work happening because once we have that, then we have a bargaining place to come from of, you know, especially with trade agreements and things like that to go, well, look, we have a domestic standard now. Um, this is, you know, this is what it is. And then we have a seat at the table for being able to st hopefully smooth the pathways because, I, um, again, if you're a small winery, you've often got small importers and, um, you know, and you're sending mixed shipments and that kind of thing, like some of our small um, European importers, for example, might be buying a pallet of mixed wines from us a year. There might be 10 different wines on that pallet, you know, and five cases of each. It adds up, you know, and that's a reason why, again, sometimes too with them having to be certified and have that cost, you know, they look at it too and think, oh, well, you know. So, yeah, it's unfortunate because I think it is, um, it's a great thing and you kind of wear it as a badge of pride and then you realise when you get further into it about about some of those challenges. But I think it's, you know, again, it's great to have that network because you talk to other people and other producers and say, okay, what have you done with your labels? How can we make this work practically that we're sort of setting ourselves up to be a bit more flexible or have those multi-market considerations? And, um, yeah, and there's a great resource now of other people to ask. But, yeah, it, it can be it can sometimes be a bit challenging. Yeah, so hence the, hence the rye, um, rye look from my, <laughs> my way. But, uh, yeah, hey, you know, it's just another challenge in the day. Another thing to add to the list. Hugh, you, I mean, you, Pyramid Valley is obviously a tiny, <laughs> tiny producer. Do you have that same sort of straddle, I guess, with navigating? I mean, you obviously there's quite a lot of sales on the domestic market for your wines as well, but is this something for your export yeah. markets? That yeah, well, it's a similar thing that we do don't label as biogreen US market, which is one of our major markets, which is those sulfite um, uh, issues. Uh, so use the same as Anna, minimal amounts to ensure that we're you know, capturing our vineyard model. Um, so that's, um, you know, it's, yeah, same, same kind of issue. For that. So it would be great to, you know, label them more you know, clearly. Um, I think one thing, you know, as a consumer, like websites are great to be able to see how people are farming, which I think is the main thing, uh, and that's um, and then researching those producers. And I think, you know, high-end wine or more premium wine, the consumer is probably looking to research what their 
drinking more too. So there's there's ways to communicate how we're you know making the wine and farming um, more than just on the on the label um, as well. So I think that's a if it, for consumers is to yeah just to get on the web the website or Instagram page and they'll see how um, how people are doing it. Yeah, you beat me to it there. I think that that's one of the brilliant kind of things that we've all had to particularly discover in the last sort of year or so, isn't it? When we've got a lot of, you know, you can't get out into your markets necessarily and we can't bring people here to show what we're doing. But there is obviously a wealth of information online with producers, with their websites, with their social media, um, with, you know, the organic wine growers. Um, site as well has a lot of information about what's going on with yeah New Zealand producers there, which um, and just some I think incredibly um, beautiful vineyards too, which are worth exploring. Because I know I always love you know that connection between what's what's in my glass and then thinking about where it's from. And if you're lucky enough sometimes to have gone and stood in those vineyards, it's neat. But the next best thing is if you you know can go and visit those sites and get a feel for the people who are making it and where it, where it is and what everything looks like. Um, I guess too, that's kind of one of those things that comes back to, you know, what is it that that draws people to organics, not not only as a producer, but as a consumer, isn't it? Is is that kind of increased um, connection? Um, you know, Hugh, what what would what is it that organics kind of means to you? What is it? Why is it that you think this is something that's important for not only you personally, but but within the context of New Zealand wine, I suppose? I I think it's just um, you know. With, there's only one, you know, earth that we've got and one place and that's, you know, like it's about, as Anna said earlier, you, you know, the I, the mindset of leaving something in a better place than you found it and, um, and yeah, and treating, you know, like the, the soil and what we, you know, what's beneath us is a lot, a lot more happening there than above us and, you know, having an understanding of what, how you know how vast the world is and how insignificant we are um and just how we can you know be you know fit into it and to me yeah that's just that want to really farm you know winemaking for me is just yeah you know farming that bit of land and, and trying to make our best expression of that side and then organics is the way you know the way to farm that, and it's just that that way we organically farm. Like our property would be different to Anna, or like as it's about being your your property and doing what's right for your your property by trial and error, I guess. But that um, Nick um, Nick Paul and who's our viticulturist has done a good little experiment in um, in Central Otago at a property there with cover crops and undies, and um, so he very cotton undies uh, in a in an area of the vineyard. <laughs> Is where... that like shorthand for under vine or something? But no, you're actually mentioning undies, underwear, knickers, pants, or all the markets but just it a shows you, it shows you how the, So he buried it under a grass area, just rye grass, and then under a diverse cover crop, and and then um, dug them back up and basically where it was buried under the diverse cover crop, all there was less was the elastic and under the grass it was like partially degraded and it really shows you how much activity is happening in the soil in that when you have some diversity there. So I think that's, you know, that's six. I don't know, I've got off track, but that's it's just, it's just how much is <laughs> happening below. <laughs> I think if there's one thing everyone's going to remember from this, hopefully they'll remember a lot of other things, but everyone's going to remember that one. <laughs> Good on Nick. <laughs> Nick and the knickers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we'll keep this on track. <laughs> Anna, I mean, you've obviously alluded to to this as well, but, you know, you've, you're 17 years down the track now. I imagine that you're kind of looking at things probably in some ways the same, but in some ways you're very different kind of a person now from when you started out there. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, exactly what Hugh said. It's just looking after your little bit of land, and that's different for different people. You know, there's not it's not a recipe. Um, it's, there's different things that work on different sites, and it takes a while to work that out. But I think, like he said, the goal is to have you know resilient vines, to have that beautiful biological activity. You know, I mean, James, uh, you know, the fairy godfather of organics in New Zealand is what Jason and I refer to him as. Um, you know, he has that very poetic thing of, you know, be careful because you're walking on the roof of another kingdom. And mm. I think that's the hard thing about soil. You know, there's it to a lot of people, it just looks like dirt. You can't see what's in there. But, you know, with that whole knowing 
you know, the amount of activity that it can be and literally a teaspoon of it. If people could see that under a microscope, I think they would care more about it. I think, you know, I often explain it to customers in cellar door that like, you know, when you've been, um, you know, snorkeling somewhere on the Great Barrier Reef, for example, you can see all of that amazing life in like a cubic metre of water in front of you. People get hugely passionate about protecting it and looking after it. And it's the hard thing with soil because you can't see it. You know, if, if, if only you could give them a microscope and they could see it, I think they would they would care more because it's it's hugely important and it makes such a big difference. You know, the whole um, encouraging the biology in the soil, you know, thinking about biodiversity because obviously vineyards, you know, do run the risk of becoming a big monoculture. You know, you have vines, you have grass that's mown, looks all super tidy. Um, and as we know, New Zealand is a pretty into neatness. I think if it was, uh, you know, an Olympic sport, we'd be um, on the podium for that. Um, but it's, you know, you can do so much more with just thinking about how you manage your mid rows. Um, and that's, yeah, just great to see. It. We even uh, this year have planted a, um, had to replant our paddock where we make our hay um, because we use that in our compost and for our cows. And Jason planted a mix in there that's, I think, about 17 or 18 different species. Um, and it's just so great to see that and the difference that it's making. And, you know, we've started doing some soil tests in there so we can monitor the, you know, the differences that we're making because often we're doing, you know, soil tests in the vineyard, but that part of the land has been, you know, our cows are on it and we make hay from it, but it, we hadn't included it in the, you know, soil test program before. So we're doing that now so we can monitor. And I think it's just always getting better, never feeling like you've achieved everything. There's always something that you want to do to keep, like Hugh was saying about the learnings, you know, there's different seasons throw you different curveballs and um, something comes up before that you haven't tried or you talk to someone else. So it's just you're never going to rest on your laurels and go, okay, we've done it all now. You're kind of always, um, mm -hmm. you know, trialling new things and keeping going there with that. So I think that's important. But, yeah, I just love the learning part of it. I think it's probably why we're all in wine in the first place. You know, it's that sort of search for never knowing everything, um, there's always something new to learn or new to try. And I think it's just great to see the groundswell of momentum that we have with organics now in New Zealand that, you know, if people listed their probably top 10 favourite wines, um, you know, especially in the premium end, I'd probably guarantee that maybe 70% of them probably are organic or BD or somewhere along the conversion process. So, um, yeah, it's just it's just exciting. I think we're in such an exciting phase of it now. Yeah, and I yeah. think too, you know, you mentioned there too, you know, nothing stays the same and, and the environment in which we're living these days is definitely not the same. I mean, climate change is here, whether people like it or not. Um, and, you know, wine, wine is going to have to deal with that. But it seems to me we were talking, I mean, I've got a, um, a glass of the Stonecroft Syrah here who are based in Hawke's Bay. And Hawke's Bay's had a couple of I mean, amazing harvests lately, but there's also been some, some very, very dry years. And having the ability um, in organic vineyards for, you know, you're obviously constantly improving that organic matter that's in the soil from a water holding capacity. I was fascinated when you mentioned about the water holding capacity of your vineyard there, because it struck me as, you know, this is a, this is a very strong tool that we have for having help uh, vineyards, you know, navigate their way through the changing climate and perhaps um, less accessibility to water so you you said what was your ability to hold water yeah absolutely so i think it's um the figures that i've seen are basically a one percent difference in organic matter is the ability um of that land to hold basically 130,000 to 170,000 litres more um per hectare so i mean that's hugely important if you look at where our wine growing regions are in general um you know probably with the exception of gisborne we're on you know we're on the east coast we're in all the dry parts of new zealand we're seeing uh you know drier and drier seasons you know we're seeing more weather variability so basically with sort of since we took over the property here especially with the older part of the vineyard we started at about two percent organic matter and we've now got parts of the property to nearly seven percent so we did a calculation that worked out with that 5% increase across the property in the sort of, you know, um, since we started our, you know, um, certification and whatever, I mean, Jason started doing cover crops straight away to make that difference. We've now got the ability on just our little 11 hectares to hold 6.5 million litres of water, you know, in the soil. Like if we think about that, um, it's just so, I don't know, it's just so exciting. And again, it's one of those things that's not measurable. It's not, well, it is measurable, but, you know, it's not obvious. People yeah. don't see it from just walking on your property and, you know, they see the obvious things, the vines, the buildings, the whatever, but what we can do there, um, and especially that's translatable across so many different properties. It doesn't necessarily have to be if people didn't want to go the whole hog of getting certified organic, they can still plant a cover crop, you know, like it's 
a lot of those things are applicable, I think, to the greater part of the industry. Um, and yeah, it does make us future proof. It's really helping with some of those challenges that we might be facing in the next 10 years and the next 20 years. You know, we're seeing our vintages start earlier and earlier in the season um, and those more variabilities. And for me, it's just a great tool to have there to know that we've banked that basically, that, you know, in a year like this when we've had a really wet winter, you know, we're storing that, we're soaking it all up in even more than we could before. So yeah, hugely important. Mm. Yeah, I often think, um, you know, when I've gone to various uh, organic wine growing conferences, I come away feeling, you know, because it's kind of easy sometimes to read the news and, and feel a bit depressed in, in many respects. But, you know, when you right now. Yeah, um, but when I come away and I look at some of the phenomenal things that are happening and also a lot of the really fascinating research in this area, it, it makes me feel really heartened and, um, you know, to feel as though not only are, you know, organic um, producers um, doing something, you know, for the, um, I guess, future proofing, as you say, of their land. Um, you know, they're, they're amazing vineyards to walk in because they always do feel so alive, but also that we are, you know, being a positive contributor to to the industry and to the world um, in that regard, which is, um, you know, it's a really, I guess, yeah, satisfying feeling to have that. Um, and I guess, you know, when you have a look, Jared, over the kind of 20 odd years that you will have been involved with this, you know, these this research, this is a really amazing cutting edge stuff that's going on in organic vineyards with a lot of, you know, kind of comparative studies and things increasingly. And, you know, when you look at things like the soil health, that that is such a such an incredible thing. When you think the World Health Organization, I think it was, estimated that under this is for agriculture as a whole, that there's possibly only, you know, 80 harvests left in the world or 80 years of viable soil. I mean, I know that, you know, stats can be worked in lots of different ways, but the point is that's quite a scary sort of a situation. So being, you know, part of the, the, the solution rather than the problem is a very good, yeah. good place to be. Yeah, and I think Anna, Anna made those points well about the water holding capacity and, and also carbon sequestration on, on soils that are biologically diverse and have good organic matter. And the other thing that is also good to keep in mind is the cultural aspect. You know, you mentioned that walking in organic vineyards is a really nice experience. Well, that's also nice for the workers in organic vineyards. You know, so it's, it's important to consider that when you, are, um, when you own a business, when you're employing people, when you're looking after the earth, you're also looking after the people that you employ. You know, there's a lot of benefits that come from converting to organic production in food as well as wine. Mm, mm, very much so. I'm just thinking, Hugh, having sat on the side of the hill in Pyramid Valley and looked out across that amazing kind of amphitheatre that you have there in the vineyard um, with a whole lot of longhorn cattle just cruising on past. It's a it's a pretty amazing environment to be in. I'll bet that's a place, you know, you, you, were, you were up at one o'clock this morning frost fighting. It must be at least nice yep. to be able to do that in a beautiful environment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like it's yeah, it's, it, it takes your breath away looking at um, looking at the place and you know the environment and you know that's New Zealand for me is uh, like is a, is it's got so much energy and vibrancy and, and it's about well, we need to ensure this is stays the way. I remember stepping off the plane for the first time in two thousand and seven and just being blown away by just how amazingly beautiful New Zealand is and the. You know, just yeah, the the environment and yeah, it's that that yeah, it's about protecting that and ensuring that's you know going forward for the future. That's you know, that, yeah, that's kind of what everyone should be about, right? Yeah, and as we're sort of discussing here, and increasingly is. I mean, I think that's that's a really heartening thing is to see, as we said, this year on year increase that's occurring of you know organic and biodynamic um, viticulture and wines in New Zealand is a really really heartening process. Um, not only is it resulting in you know as we've you know been able to see some really really delicious wines, but also a very very good thing for our environment overall. Um, so I think um, we can wrap that up today. I hope all of you watching have um, enjoyed and got a lot of information out of this as we've had some really knowledgeable people talking here. As I said, please take advantage of that live chat. Make sure you've got, if there's any last questions there that you do want to ask, get those out there because both Nigel and Clive will do a brilliant job of um, filling in any gaps and adding a few more great stories of their own. I don't doubt that for a second. Um, I want to say a huge, huge um, thank you to, um, to Anna, to Hugh, to Jared for joining me today. Um, it's been brilliant to listen. I've learned a lot from this, this session and um, Again, yeah, feeling greatly encouraged about this amazing um, 
aspect of New Zealand wine. And so I, I hope everybody out there listening, you know, does their best to seek out these wines, to find out more information, to make connections. As you've seen, New Zealand winemakers um, and BioGrow <laughs> auditors are very um, enthusiastic and knowledgeable people and are more than happy to talk. So if you've got further questions, please don't hesitate to get in contact. Um, you know, you can direct them through New Zealand wine growers as well and have a chat and keep exploring amazing New Zealand wine, organic wine. Thank you so much. Hi everybody, uh, Clive Doodle, thanks for that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that um, seminar. It's, um, it's a real sign of things that we're actually holding these sorts of seminars now for everybody. Um, just want to, uh, before I forget, I've been asked just to remind you all that there's a survey in the bottom underneath the, underneath the screen there, and it'd be really um, great if we could get some feedback from you, please, um, about this. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, organic wine has really moved forward in a huge way in the, in the last few years, I suppose. Um, I've been in the organic wine sector for about 15 years, uh, making wines at Saracen before um, starting up deep down and being involved with organic wine growers New Zealand for probably uh, six or seven years and currently I'm the chair of it and it's an honour for me. Um, it's something that I do kind of, I mean, it's the only thing I know where you get a group of volunteers together that are able to create such change. It's like your social responsibility. Um, and it's exciting to be at the pointy end of the, of the wine industry. You know, there's a huge um, demand for organic wine now, as some of the, um, some of the chats have pointed out and, and has been um, highlighted in the seminar. It's, it's incredible now. I think the fact that consumers are asking more about what's in their products, um, whether it's food or even the T-shirts that they buy, people want to know about accountability. And wine's definitely been, um, you know, kind of a little bit behind that, I suppose, or maybe people just kind of assumed wine was just kind of romantically organic. You know, you grow grapes, you crush them with your feet and you pop them in the bottle. But as, as we all know, that's not really the case. Um, it's, it's um, I think organics is so important because it's, own, it's really the only um, kind of certified um, system that exists in the world, something that you can trust. If something's certified organic, you know, you can trust what's in that. Um, and I think that's what the, certainly the younger consumers today are... Um, are demanding and, and it's healthy. And I think, you know, there was a really good question earlier on in the, in the chat, which is hard when you're typing just to kind of get across the right, uh, the, the right messaging. Um, and the question was, why do you think organics has become um, so popular now? And I think, yes, we can talk about what's in wine and chemicals and blah, blah, blah. But actually I think organics now has the association directly with quality. And I think that's hugely important. And, as the seminar um, highlighted, it's the best producers in New Zealand that are going organic. And not necessarily just because they don't want to put things in their wine, but it's because they want to make better wine. And that's the biggest thing. There's no doubt, in my experience, I've seen um, working on organic vineyards that the, the, great, the, the vineyards are healthier, they're more diverse, you're looking after your asset, you're looking after the environment. But diversity creates this um, resilience in, in the system. It's not a monoculture of just vine after vine after vine after vine and nothing else. You have resilience there. You have different levels of insects, different, um, you know, sort of flora, uh, vegetation, animals, more trees, all those sorts of things. And resilience creates, you know, the diversity and resilience creates this amazing connection with the soil. You've got a living soil. You've got a living system happening. And in a living system, you're going to get better ingredients. And so you do get better grapes from these, um, from these vineyards. Obviously, better grapes equals better wine. And I think that's the main point that we always try to put across from Organic Wine Growers New Zealand, is that organics is directly linked to quality. And that's the reason why um, generally people do it. It's really exciting to see the consumer asking for it now. It's taken a very, very long time. And um, yeah, in my experience, as I, as I mentioned in the chat, launching a new brand about uh, three years ago. We went into crowded markets with a little brand um, and everybody was so open to it. We were asked all the time, well, are you organic? And we were like, yeah, we are. They were like, oh, thank God. We've been waiting for this. We get offered new wines from new countries all the time. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not all the same, but it's crowded that we need new stories. The consumer's asking for something else. And so finally... Organics is, the, is in that place and we're able to make the most of it. So I think that's everything that there is at the moment. Um, I'm just checking to see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, 
there aren't any. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much for attending. We really appreciate it. We're excited to be able to do these things. It's the new, it's the new way now to uh, do these things, to connect people all over the world from your homes, from your offices. Um, it's been a fantastic event and we look forward to doing some more with you soon. Thanks very much.